Okay, we're going to continue with our discussion of optimal taxation in a variant of the Lucas and Stokey model. And the variant is we've shut down almost all markets except the market in risk free securities, one period risk free securities. So Lucas and Stokey were making extensive list of a complete array of Aero securities or Aero and De Bruce securities, depending on which formalization you use. Um, we are now going to pursue the idea of AMSS of shutting down all markets except one, except that in a risk-free one period bond. So last time in the last lecture, we let's just review what we did. We, we use a first order approach. We worked in a space of sequences. We formed a, we formed a Lagrangian, um, which differed from Lucas and Stokey's Lagrangian, the one that we used to, to, to study their model, principally in having many, many more implementability constraints. They had one. We have uh, one for each date and one for each history. And we were forced into that by having a whole bunch of measurability constraints that had an interesting structure that we described. So we used a couple of tricks, a law of iterated expectations and Abel's summation formula. And we, uh, we derived, um, the first order conditions and um, and then we had some discussion of them. We stared at them, number 14 and 15. 15 wasn't present in Lucas and Stokey um, or another way to say it was automatically satisfied at a gamma equals zero in Lucas and Stokey. Um, it's looked a lot like Lucas and Stokey. It has lots of the same terms except it's got um, it's got something that was constant in Lucas and Stokey. This was a fee. It is now uh, something that's time varying and history dependent. Um, and then there's this additional term, which is only present, had a term like this. It was only a present at time zero um, in Lucas and Stokey. And here it's omnipresent as long as the implementability constraints on the measurability constraints are, are binding. That's where we started. So we're going to we're going to describe now a, a way of uh, of, um, of belmanizing the problem. Okay, so we're going to use an approach similar to what we've used um, in earlier lectures. Um, so again, this is all going to be about finding the state is an art. Um, so we have the government budget constraints. Um, we're going to set transfers to zero for most of the time. Um, but in chapter 16, there's a discussion of the circumstances in which they should not be set to zero. And I'll ask you to read that. Okay, so if we set transfers to zero, the, the budget constraint has this form. Um, and we're going, through, we're going through steps in a couple earlier lectures. We're copying the steps basically that we used to, to Bellmanize the original Lucas and Stokey model. Um, something that they did not do, they, they did not Bellmanize their model but we did earlier. Okay, so the budget constraint, the household, but we're gonna work with the household budget constraint. Valra's law says we can, we, can, we can work with either the households or the consumers in terms of deriving imp representations of the relevant restrictions on Ramsey allocations. So, Again, we, 
go through these steps, we we take the first order conditions for the household, the consumption of oil equation, and we take the atemporal condition, and we use those to eliminate prices and the tax rate from the budget constraint. So if we do that, um, we get this equation. Uh, now we're starting to depart from Lucas and Stokey. Um, if you go back and uh, look at, 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 what, at what they have. Um, so we can rewrite this equation like this. And now we have, um, and we're departing from Lucas and Stokey in terms of the dates, the dating of this object. Um, BT uh, cannot depend on ST. It can only depend on ST minus one. And in the Lucas and Stokey model with state contingent debt, it could depend on ST. So that's going to be a key difference. And it's going to, it's going to lead to a subtle difference in the way we want to attack and formulate the Bellman equations for this model. Okay, so now what we're going to do, finding the state, we're going to define um, this object, xt, and it's going to, we're going to define xt is equal to um, this thing. Um, and by construction, it is uh, measurable with respect to date t information. Okay, so that depends on date T information. That conditional expectation is conditioned on ST and um, everything checks out. So XT is measurable with respect to ST. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna represent the, the household's budget constraint at time T history ST as equal to this. I'm going to write this. And what you have to verify is that this thing here and this thing here are equivalent with that definition of XT. And you can check that it, um, and you can check that it is. Um, okay. So, so here's our representation um, of the of the time t budget constraint. So. So now we're gonna we're gonna um, we can we can write um, I can write this um, an earlier equation um, like this. That's just rewriting. Uh, and again, this th thing on this side is measurable with respect to ST and this side is measurable with respect to ST minus one. Um, so these equations, these equations are our representation of the additional measurability constraints that the AMS model adds to the Lucas and Stokey model. So now we're going to do our our trick that we've we've encountered before. We're going to Bellmanize this problem, and be, it's a Ramsey problem, and we're going to have two sub problems. Uh, one for a date t equals zero Ramsey planner, 
and we're going to have a great t greater than or equal to one continuation Ramsey planner. And these are going to have different state variables, and the Bellman equations are going to be different, and they're going to have different policy functions. And those differences are the signature of the time inconsistency of the Ramsey plan. So now we're going to we're going to make this as close as we could we can to what we did to the with the Lucas and Stokey model. So we're going to let pi be a Markov transition matrix, and we're going to use this notation s minus for last period and s for this period. And we're going to watch when this appears as a conditioning variable. So whenever you do Bellman equations um, or dynamic programming, the first thing you do is you use the word let. So we're going to have to, because it's dynamic programming squared, we're going to have to say let twice. So what V of X, now we're going to do this key thing, this is going to be X ante. This value function is going to be X ante, meaning before S, before S. So we're going to let X minus and S minus be the continuation value of a continuation random planner, a uh, Ramsey plan when x t minus one is x minus and s t minus one is s minus, and that's gonna be true for t greater than or equal to one. It's kind of a mouthful, so stare at that. And then we're gonna let w of b be b and s. So notice these are different state variables. So different state variables. Um, this is x post. This is after. It's going to be the value of the Ramsey plan at time zero when initial government debt is B0 inherited from the past and the initial state is S. So the arguments of, of V are last periods X and last periods S, even though this is for a Ramsey plan, continuation Ramsey plan for T greater than or equal to one. Okay, so for T greater than or equal to one, the value function for a continuation Ramsey planner is going to satisfy this Bellman equation. Um, so here's the deal. Um, at time, now again, this is x ante. So uh, before anything has happened in the period, what the continuation Ramsey planner is going to do is He's going to take whatever x minus 1 he was handed and whatever s was last period, and he's going to choose a sequence, uh, he's going to choose a employment x of s sequence, and what's x, uh, I'm sorry, x of s vector, these are two vectors, these are both vectors that have the same dimension as s. He's going to choose those to maximize this object, the expected value. Um, of, well, here's the utility, the time, the time now, um, utility of the representative consumer plus beta times the um, continuation Ramsey planners value ex ante next period. That's a mouthful. And that's going to be subject to these implementability conditions, one for each S. So this thing, this thing is a version of this thing that we wrote um, up, up here earlier. It's a version of 20. Okay, so those are our implementability conditions, and there's one for each S. That's the way we're going to do this. And when we're doing this, is there's several other people who've who've used um, 
methods like this. Um, Yvonne Werning, Emmanuel Fari in his JP paper, um, Mike Golosov, um, and in situations like this, you have to be careful on what's, the whole trick here is finding the state and getting the timing right. So now there's this ex ante, ex post distinction. Okay, so if you stare at this, you'll see that this is a way of insisting that the implementability constraints um, are, are satisfied. And then, um, okay, again. So I recommend that you pause the lecture and stare at this. And then what the Ramsey planner is going to do, this is subprob, the next subproblem, he's going to take B0 and S0 zero, and he's going to just choose N0 in this. He's going to just choose one. So this is an ex post problem. So the Ramsey, the, the value function for the Ramsey planner satisfies this Bellman equation, um, where the continuation value that he, he, he or she faces is that for the continuation Ramsey planner that's going to succeed them. So we saw this used working backwards. And now you can see um, if you are a little familiar with computers, um, this is something that we could actually think of firing up on a Python or MATLAB um, to solve a, uh, you know, this, this looks like a, a, a Bell, this first, this pair looks like a Bellman equation that's often solved in computational economics classes. Um, and then once that's solved, this is easy. And that's what we're actually going to do. Okay. And um, so that's it. So now we're going to start an analyzing this. Um, so what we can do is now we can use all the machinery of uh, dynamic programming, stuff that you learned last year, to get some um, first order conditions associated with the Bellman equations and um, do some stirring at it. So, so what you can find is the uh, get the first order condition with respect to xs, and you get this equation. Um, if you apply a uh, an envelope condition uh, theorem to uh, to this Bellman equation, the this this um, you'll get this equation. And then you um, you stare at them and rearrange. You will get this equation. Um, and now, what what this equation says is that I'm going to say that what this says is that v of x is a risk-adjusted martingale because. Um, why do I say that? Well, so the right-hand side, okay, this thing, if this term weren't here, if this term weren't here, this would just be the conditional expectation of V sub X next period. And what that says is the conditional expectation of VX next period is just equal to VX now. So that's saying that e, you know, e t um, minus one. Literally, it's saying e t of v x of v x uh, um, t. Here we use this lazy notation is equal to v x t minus one. Now exchanging the left and right sides, but this is um, if that term weren't there. But this term is here. 
So what, but what does this term do? Well, this term, a um, couple of things. If you stare at it, you'll see that UC of S is, we're going to assume that margin of is a positive. And what this is, is this is, so this thing, this thing is a random variable from the point of view of time, love last time. It's non-negative. And furthermore, it's mean is one. If you take this term, E T minus one of this term, it's one. Well, that means it's a likelihood ratio. A non-negative random variable whose mean is one is a likelihood ratio. So what this thing is doing is it's taking pi and a density and it's twisting it. That's this argument is true state by state. It's twisting it by a likelihood ratio. Um, you can figure out the kind of uh, thing that it's doing. It's it's actually it's actually um, well you could see it's lowering uh, probabilities where marginal utility is low and it's raising them when marginal utilities are high. So it's um, it's twisting the, the the distribution. So instead of the, instead of this being this being true, this is a twisted martingale. Um, this is a martingale with respect to a twisted probability distribution. And um, Daryl Duffy calls this a um, he calls this a um, marginal utility adjusted martingale. A risk he calls it a risk. He calls it a risk adjusted malt, martingale because this is making a risk adjustment. Um, is used a lot in asset pricing theory. So, um, okay. So, uh, so there's this martingale thing lurking around. We'll come back to this. Okay, so, um, okay, so now, so now um, we're going to get a result that AMS has got kind of a, a result um, see what happens in this so this was one of the results in this JP paper so instead of opposing T T equals zero that transfers we're going to allow transfers now but we're going to say they're non-negative so the government can't impose lump sum taxes but it can give lump sum transfers we're going to make that and um, We'll see why this plays. And we're also going to assume um, some, of the, some of the exercises at the end of chapter 16, I might ask you to work one or two of these later. Um, they, they simplify the setting by making the utility function quasi-linear. So this, what this is going to do is it's going to make, going to make the utility linear and leisure, but we're going to have it curved with respect to le labor. And that's going to simplify the calculation of the optimal tax. Um, so if that's true, um, when you calculate VX, this is a non-positive martingale. Um, okay, because look, if you see Uh, if C is constant, I'm sorry, if, if this is quasi-linear, this term is just one. This term is one. So now, Vx, V sub x is a martingale. And it's a non-positive martingale. Um, it's a non-positive -mart martingale, and it, and it, uh, it converges. Um, so it converges almost surely. Um, and it's going to turn out that if, if this is perpetually random, um, so it's non-positive, so it's bounded above. So Dube's Martingale Convergence Theorem says that a bounded 
Martingale converges almost surely. And that theorem is going to apply that Vx is going to converge almost surely to zero. Um, in which case, uh, we do a little arithmetic. If it converges to zero, um, what's going to happen is in the limit, um, it's going to have to be that the margin utility of leisure is equal to margin utility of consumption. And that's going to imply that the labor tax rate is zero. Um, so what's going to happen is asymptotically, um, the government is going to, um, so how could that be? What's going to happen is in this economy, the government is going to actually be saving um, by acquiring claims on the private sector. It's gradually going to be do that, doing that in response to randomness. And as random as, as it's going to, even if we start off with debts, it's, debts are going to um, be paid off and then it's going to start acquiring assets and eventually it's going to have so many assets that it can finance its all of its government expenditures by interest on the assets that the private sector owes it and we eventually go to a situation where we have first best uh, there's no distorting taxes, unlike Lucas and Stokey. Um, so this was the finding, and and to actually support that, there's a detail. The government's going to collect so much revenue that it's actually going to have to transfer some of it back occasionally to complete this argument. So that's all coming from the manipulation of this first order condition. Okay. Um, okay, so we got that very easily with with this with this uh, setting. Okay, so um, now there's they're going to um, what we saw last time was uh, in an earlier lecture we saw that. Um, when we Bellmanized the Lucas and Stokey model, we we had the continuation with the continuation Ramsey planner having a state variable state factor was which which was a pair x t and s t, but then on the equilibrium path, x t turned out to be an exact function of s t. So we call that state variable degeneracy, and that turned out to be a kind of symptom that there were complete markets available to the government. And here's how we can take a look at that. Um, so for us, um, that's not gonna happen. Uh, the counterpart of XT is it's actually big, it's actually gonna be entire, it's gonna be history dependent. Um, and we wanna see where this surface is. Um, so, so the key thing is, it's right here, that, so before, in the Lucas Stokey model, uh, Vx turned out to be, turned out to be equal to phi, but, um, a constant. But here, in our model, Vx is going to vary over time. It's not constant. And the consequence of that is we're going to need both x and s to, um, to characterize um, to, to, be, to, be, to be the state of the continuation Ramsey planner. And it's going to turn out, now remember I said this mystery at the beginning, what Lucas and Stokey wrote their paper, partly because they wanted to understand Barrow's paper, where he had random walk 
components of uh, of the tax rate and tax collections. They could not recover that. Well, it's going to turn out that the fact that VX is not a constant, but it's a risk-adjusted martingale, that's going to go a long way toward, um, that's going to be essential in giving uh, not exactly what Barrow got, but a big component of tax rates that look like Barrow. Um, okay. Um, okay, so kind of there's a, le there's a research lesson in here. Um, and if you look at the history of thought, Barrow wrote down wrote this seventy nine paper. It's by today's standard, it's hard to read. Um, in some ways, because um, he left some things in, implicit and didn't write all the all the math out, and that left Lucas and Stokey puzzled. They wrote down what they thought might be a a version of the kind of thing he had in mind, and then they didn't recover at all what what he what he had so that makes you scratch your head yeah so 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 what do you, do you just stop there and say well you know there was wrong or, or do you or do you kind of say well he must have had something else in mind even if he didn't write all the equations so could you kind of reverse engineer could you tamper with Lucas and Stokey's setup to, how would you have to tamper with Lucas and Stokey's setup to to move part way or as far as you could toward barrel. And that's kind of, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, so, so now we're gonna, we're gonna, um, so we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. So now what I wanna do is take up uh, an example of the, of this model that, that has an interesting feature. Okay, so what we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna discover something that there's a special case of this model, um, and in which it, that turns out to be um, there's incomplete markets, but it turns out um, the measurability constraints don't bind. And that's going to be a symptom that um, and there's a typo here um, the key thing is it's going to be a situation in which the Lucas and Stokey Ramsey planner so we're gonna, there's going to be a setting in which parameters are such, stochastic process is such, that even though the Lucas and Stokey planner could issue state contingent debt, it just doesn't do it. Um, we're going to kind of ask, um, how could that be? So, key thing is, in this model, the risk-free interest rate is going to move. It's gonna, it's gonna be a function of S at time T, um, and it's gonna move in a way that actually provides the the government all the sh the insurance that the Ramsey planner wants the, the wants the the government to have. That's gonna be the deal. So I'm gonna follow. This is all a in a in a working paper by. Bandari, Evans, Golosov. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to set the number of states equal to two. We're going to assume the state is IID. So the transition matrix looks like this. It's just a vector. Um, and the implementability constraints are going to be evaluated at the constant value of this state. Um, it's gonna, all this is a special case. We're reverse engineering a special case in which the government in the Lucas Stokey model would actually choose not to um, issue state contingent debt. It's gonna issue 
it's, it's going to turn out that the debt it issues is not going to depend on the next period state. It's just going to be constant. Um, okay. Okay, so, so the idea is we're going, to, um, we're going to make this guess that there's this constant value where x minus is equal to x of s. Um, and um, this is going to be satisfied. Um, so then in this case, the, um, the risk of adjusted Martingale equation just becomes, becomes a constant um, that's independent of the state. And the, um, the continuation Ramsey planner is going to face first order conditions that look like this. And they're going to be, um, there's going to be four equations and four unknowns that can be solved for um, for the things they have to be solved for. And under some conditions on the utility function, these equations have a, have a unique um, solution that actually features, it, it actually features a, a negative value of this. So here, um, the consumption and the, and the labor tax rate can be constructed as, as history independent functions of x of s. So this is starting to now look like very much like Lucas and Stokey. Remember, Lucas and Stokey found that the tax rate only depends on the Markov state. That's going to be true here. Um, and um, so government, so now what's going to happen is, so here, uh, what's fluctuating? Um, the tax rate fluctuates, the margin to consumption fluctuates, the risk-free interest rate fluctuates, but X does not fluctuate and neither does this multiplier mu of S. And then this is this Lucas Stokey thing. So, um, so for this to work, complete the right reverse engineering, the, um, for it to be in a steady state, it's necessary that the initial debt be zero um, satisfy the implementability constraint um, at this value. So that can be solved for um, if you, so once we, we've got x0 and we've got um, n, um, we, if we substitute in, we get this and we solve. So there's an, an initial value of the Okay, so, so this constant value of this Lagrange multiplier um, is a telltale sign that the um, measurability restrictions aren't binding. They're f so, um, okay, so, so when they're slack, um, as we, as I said, this can be regarded as a, a Lucas and Stokey economy, uh, a very special one. Okay. Um, then it turns out, okay, this was also shown in this Beggs paper. It's kind of interesting. It showed, even if you, they showed that if you don't start from that, if you start from a, the wrong B0, um, well then, um, it's not equivalent with the Lucas and Stokey economy, but what they show is that it actually converges to Lucas and Stokey economy. So, okay. So that might be worth looking at for a little bit. Okay, so now I'm going to conclude this lecture with um, just running through some examples. So these examples are all computed with some... Um, with some uh, with some code that um, that's in Python that's in this lecture. So I'm just going to pass by the code, um, and you know the 
I've shown you the equations that are being solved. Um, actually, this code actually does things too. Um, anyway, okay, so, so, so here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to study this anticipated one period war, which is one of the examples in chapter 16. It's one of the examples in chapter 16 that we studied with the Lucas and Stokey model. So, um, so we have a kind of standard utility function. Um, the government expenditure process is going to be exactly what it was uh, for the example that we talked about in the Lucas and Stokey lecture. Uh, government expenditures are known sh for sure in all periods except one. Uh, they're low in peacetime, but in time t equals three, there could be a war. It occurs with probability 0.5. Um, and then what we did is we used our we used our trick to define the components of the uh, state vector um, as as tg pairs. So this is how we we mapped um, this setting into a Markov process. Uh, we got this transition matrix, which we saw before. This is all exactly what we did before. And we have government expenditures for each state. Um, this is T, this is T equals three and peace. And this is T equals three and war. And uh, you, you'll see what the transition, the transition matrix we go, um, we go, we can see that this uh, last state's an, an, an absorbing state. Okay, good. Um, okay, good. And it's a one period war. So you could stare at this. Okay. Um, so we're going to have these figures that are going to show um, what what the um, what's going on. So um, so when the government has access to state contingent debt, um, we're going to show things in black lines. And when the government has there's only a risk free bond, they're going to be in red. Okay, so here's here's what things look like. Um, st we're stare at this, um, and um, lots of messages. Lots of messages are here um, with these preferences. Um, okay, so first thing you'll notice is. Um, Look at look at the con, look at the consumption allocation. I'm gonna change. Look at the consumption allocation. Um, so and the labor. Um, and one thing that's striking is that the allocation is fairly close. Um, Okay, so okay, so so it's going on in in black. Um, so notice under both under both settings, um, the the government is manipulating the interest rate um, at time zero. And this is showing, this is showing the telltale sign of, of um, this is showing the telltale sign of time inconsistency. Um, it's actually lowering the tax rate at time, um, at time zero. 
in order to manipulate the time zero interest rate. It's doing that in both cases. Um, in terms of tax moving, um, look what happens right here with the difference between the the difference between the most of what we want in terms of tax rate. And in the Lucas Stokey model with complete markets, the government was completely smoothing the tax rate over time and across states in this setting. Um, and the way the government, the way the government um, managed that is, remember, the black is, is complete markets. Um, so what it did at time period T and time period two, it, it issued, um, it issued two different levels of government debt, state contingent debt at time three. Um, if there was, if there was war, um, the private sector uh, owed the government some money um, relative to what would happen in peace. So it owed the private sector less in times of war than it did in times of peace. Um, so that gap right there is, is indicating the state contingency and that's supporting this tax rate that's as flat as a pancake. But now with incomplete markets, the government can't do that. It has to pick a single number. And you'll see what it does is it, it splits the difference. It actually, it actually, um, it actually uh, issues an amount of debt. Well, it looks like it's in between those two. Um, and then this, what, what it does is it issues, um, um, you know, it's actually done some saving in anticipation of the war. You could see it's doing some precautionary saving in anticipation of the war. Um, and it's actually starting to do it earlier. And then uh, when the war ends, um, it, um, well, if there's peacetime, it just leaves the war. See, if, if there was no war, this is the no war path. It did that precautionary saving, but the event didn't happen. So it just leaves with a, with a lower debt level. And what it does is it lowers the tax rate after the war. So it has to service a lower debt. But if there was a war, it uh, ran a deficit during the war um, and left the war with high government debt. And um, so you'll see how government debt and the tax rate varies. Now, what you'll actually see is um, this kind of behavior gives rise to um, a history dependence in the, in the tax rate. Um, you know, the history dependence is all about this one event in this thing, but it gives rise to this history dependent, gives rise to a permanent um, either reduction or increase in the tax rate. And that is kind of what Barrow had in mind. Um, and this all, this all shows up in, um, in persistence in, in other effects. Output, there's permanent, because the tax rate has a, uh, the legacy of this war is a, uh, a war of peace is a, a permanent change in the tax rate. That shows up in permanent changes in labor supply. You see, this kind of has a unit root random walk, just doesn't die. That's because of the, our martingale. So I ask you to stare at this. Um, and there's some discussion about this. Um, and then um, we have some other examples. Um, so there's another example that 
I think you can gather some same things about. Um, so there's another study um, that was also studied in, in the earlier lecture. And um, there's a comparison of what, what the, um, I won't go through this, this is best studied by on your own, um, about the differences between the um, complete and incomplete markets. Um, and then, um, okay, so I advise that you study this remark a little bit on your own. And then there's some examples here. It's kind of a reader's guide. And um, if you'll actually see, um, you'll actually see this kind of graph um, in the complete markets, um, this Markov case, if we do a long simulation, government debt goes between two values. Um, and that's because that state, con state contingent debt is going to be, when we studied the Lucas Stokey model, it's going to oscillate between two values. But in, a, in the incomplete markets model, it's going to drift. And actually, if you kind of look at the way it drifts, um, it's drifting in a random walky like way, but it's, it's got a purpose. It's actually drifting down. And, um, and this is because of this AMS S force that's also showing up in the tax rate um, because of this precautionary savings like behavior that the government's engaging in. So this path is history dependent. This to path this to path depends on S T, whereas this only depends on S T. That's the Lucas and Stokey. Okay, so you could study that on your own, and I think um, this is going to be the end of um, our study of the AMSS.